Hello, it's Scott Manley here. SpaceX fans have been interested in the development of Starship, the next generation of SpaceX rockets. And while there's a bunch of people down in Boca Chica pointing cameras across you know, several miles of shoreline to get glimpses of the Starship hopper flying, we also have people that have been watching the various publications that come out with something as big as this. And a big one dropped, the draft environmental assessment for the SpaceX Starship and Super Heavy Launch Vehicle at Kennedy Space Center, open parentheses KSC. So this basically confirms that they are going to be planning to use the Kennedy Space Center in Florida as their primary launch site. And for this then, because it's a government organization using government land, they have to perform this environmental impact assessment. They have to make sure not only that they're protecting the land inside the area, but they have to make sure that they're not you know, causing trouble for the neighbors. They're not blowing out their neighbors' windows, for example, with too much noise. They have to make sure that they're not going to ruin the, you know, the wildlife that lives inside the uh, space complex. Because, you know, there's actually a lot of protected areas inside this. And of course, they also have to protect the history. And that's not, you know, as, as silly as you would think, because Launch Complex 39A is actually a historic place, as is the Crawlerway. You know, they launched people to the moon from this. But over at Landing Zone 1, they do confirm that it is not a historic site and there's no archaeological resources. They didn't accidentally build it over a Native American burial site, so we're not going to have poltergeists coming up and knocking the spacecraft out of the sky. So anyway, this environmental report has to consider a lot of details that haven't previously been public, and that's why it is interesting to SpaceX watchers. So if we skip forward, this is the main map of the area. We have Launch Complex 39A up the top. We have a few locations with a payload processing facility, Hangar M, and this is the landing zone here. So you see that they launch from here, they land down here, and they will obviously have to move these large stages around all, all these roads. So that's part of the, the thing that they're checking out. Now, a few pages down, we have actual numbers on things, right? We have the size of things, the Starship being 55 meters in length, 9 meters in diameter. The whole integrated vehicle with Super Heavy and Starship will be 118 meters in height. And that is about 7 meters taller than the Saturn V. Uh, but more interestingly, the top of the fully integrated rocket would stand 150 meters above ground level. So there's another 30 meters of launch pad. And I think, judging by what I've seen elsewhere, this is the flame diverter system. So the amount of power coming out of this thing is kind of crazy. In fact, they tell you right here, the launch mass of this will be about 5,000 metric tons, and it will be generating 62 meganewtons, or about six, over 6,000 tons of thrust at liftoff. All that energy from all those engines, and I note that it says 31 booster engines, that number has since got bigger. All that energy, all that power, could damage the rocket, so of course they're going to have to have a serious flame diverter. And so here we actually get into some of the details on the construction. So it talks about the launch mount would be elevated up to approximately 30 meters to reduce excess recirculation and erosion from rocket exhaust. A flame diverter would be constructed instead of a flame trench. The flame diverter would be composed of metal piping and it would measure approximately 20 meters wide by 20 meters tall and be positioned directly under the rocket. So this is adding 30 meters to the rocket itself. So it's already taller than the Saturn V and the size of this diverter system will probably make it taller still. Uh, they're also planning to construct a landing pad for potential future launch vehicle returns. So that is the Starship pad here. This is just for the Starship, not for the boosters. The boosters are apparently planning to land off the coast. They're going to use existing shuttle hardware. So the hydrogen would have normally been there. They're going to use the existing hydrogen sphere to contain the uh, liquid methane. And they only need to contain about 2,000 tons of liquid methane. The hydrogen that they had on site for the space shuttle was lower density. So they think they can just use 
basically the same tanks that the space shuttle used. On the oxygen side, they'll use a lot of the same hardware, but they'll have to add more capacity here. They'll also have um, 1,500 tons of liquid nitrogen on site to help cool the uh, liquid uh, liquid methane. So yeah, we got a ni na landing zone, starship pad, all this stuff ready to go. There's an interesting part here which implies that they're going to actually be building most of the rockets uh, in two places. First of all, they're going to build the engines and a lot of technical components at the factory in Hawthorne, California. But the large components, right, the structures, the tanks that they've been welding and all that, I think those are going to be built out on the East Coast because... They're just huge and you don't want to transport those massive distances. Well, and you want to transport them to space, obviously, but if you're transporting them over the ground, you don't want to be moving them on roadways or ships because they're just so darn big. So it looks to me like they're actually planning to build them at the Cape and they're just going to put them in a big tent or a big factory and weld them all together put all the engines on there. And then down here, you can see that they're gonna be integrating vertically on the launch pad using a mobile crane initially. And then at a later date, they would have a permanent crane which could be as high as 180 meters. After launch, they plan to land the Starship at landing zone one. And the Super Heavy will land on a barge. So here's actually the landing profile they have here. Notice they have about 15 minutes of hypersonic flight. They drop down to supersonic speed and then they're subsonic for the last few minutes before they do their landing burn, which is pretty cool. The super heavy booster would land downrange on a drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean. They don't have plans to land this back at LZ-1 just yet because it is big, I guess. Since I'm on the West Coast, I was interested to see if they plan to fly Starship and Super Heavy out of Vandenberg, and the answer is no, at least initially. First of all, Slick 4 would require a lot more changes. The 39A was, a, was originally built for the Apollo program and it flew space shuttles, so it was able to handle the large amounts of fuel. Slick 4 wasn't going to be able to do that, but also because the Vandenberg is limited largely to polar launches, they have decided not to do that, at least initially. So it could be that we have Falcon 9 site maintained on the West Coast longer than you get it on the East Coast. They also considered using Slick 4 as a landing location, so they would fly in over the Pacific and land there. But then the problem is, how do you transport Starship back from Slick 4 all the way across the US to the 39A launch site? And so yeah, that's not going to happen, so we're not going to see landings or launches of Starship or Super Heavy on the West Coast for quite a while right now. So the report obviously goes into great detail about the actual sound levels that are expected. And, you know, these are not particularly loud compared to many other rockets. Certainly they're covering a wider area. But yeah, they cover the landings, the launches, the static fire test of both the Starship and the Super Heavy booster. But most interestingly, they actually model the sonic boom of the return. So this is a Starship coming back. And you'll notice it has to fly over Florida to do this. That blue area, that is kind of the level at which you pretty much everyone will hear the sonic boom as it flies across the Gulf of Mexico. Now in the appendices, there's uh, some really good data on the Raptor engine. And that's because, of course, to figure out the environmental effects, you need to figure out what kind of chemistry is coming out of it. So this actually starts with a model of a Raptor engine, you know, the, when you're burning liquid oxygen and liquid methane. They tell you the mixture ratios, the power cycles, and they have actual numbers on the throat, the, the nozzle and everything that they're using. So they perform a bunch of analysis on this. They take every single chemical reaction that could potentially happen. And, you know, I know you're thinking that it's burning liquid oxygen and methane. This should be very, very simple, right? But actually, no, in reality, every carbon atom doesn't pair up with two oxygen atoms and two hydrogen atoms don't automatically pair up with one, uh, with one oxygen atom. You have a whole cornucopia of reactions that can actually happen. And not only that, you will get things like nitrogen coming in because 
the air from the atmosphere will get entrained in the exhaust and that will start mixing in. So they come up with these numbers for what will come out of it. And then as they go down somewhere around here, they start to figure out about air getting entrained depending upon you know the how far downstream. And then that affects their uh, models for the amount of nitrogen dioxide or nitrous oxide getting created. Not nitrous oxide, but you know, the nitrogen oxides of nitrogen. Uh, they, they also point out that yes, they can't really do this properly for how, all 31 engines, but they, they take a decent guess at it using the 24 outermost engines. Uh, <laughs> and so that's how they come up with their answers that they applied for the, the pollution model of the engine of overall. So it's been quite fascinating watching people dig into this document and come up with you know, information, clues about how the whole thing will operate, how they're going to move the boosters around, what the sonic booms will be like. So yeah, it, definitely go and check out the various threads on Reddit or NASA Spaceflight because you will learn a lot about things. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs>